Thank you. We're not going to tarry. Are you ready for Farcon? Are you ready for Farcon? Let's bring our brother Minister on. I know you love him because I love him. So let's bring our bro love brother Minister Louis Farcon. Let's welcome him to Las Vegas, Nevada. Let's hear it from you. Brother Minister Louis Farcon. Let's hear it, brothers and sisters. This is the man you've been waiting for. You've been waiting for this black man all your life. Let's bring him on. Let me hear it. Let me hear it for Minister Farrakhan. Let's hear it. Let's, let's look at this great black man that God made for us. God made him for you and me. Let's bring him on, brothers and sisters. Let's bring him on. I know you love him. Bring your great black leader on. This is a man you've been waiting for. Minister Louis Farrakhan. That's it. Farrakhan, 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 Farrakhan. made him for you and me. He's here, brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Come on, I know you love him. This is your man here. He's with us. Come on, brothers and sisters. Let's hear it for him. Thank you. Thank you. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the one God to whom all praise is due, the Lord of the worlds, the beneficent, the most merciful. We give praise and thanks to Allah, the one God, for sending us Moses and giving us the Torah or the Old Testament. And we believe in Moses and we believe in the Old Testament. We thank Allah for sending Jesus and for revealing through him the good news, the gospel, the New Testament. And we believe in Jesus and we believe in the gospel. We thank Allah for sending to us Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, through whom the Holy Quran was revealed. And we believe in Muhammad, and we believe in the Holy Quran. But if I lived to be a thousand, I don't think I could praise or thank God enough for raising up in our midst a divine leader, teacher, and guide who has made the Torah, the Gospel, and the Quran relevant books for the salvation of oppressed black people, Native Americans, Chicanos and oppressed people throughout the world. The man who taught me what I know. The man who gave me the example of what a man should be. And the example of the man I'm trying yet to become. I'm speaking of my leader and teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I greet all of you. 
My dear and beloved brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace, we say it in the Arabic language, Assalamu Alaikum, and it means peace be unto you. To Brother Minister Alfred Muhammad, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us in the nation of Islam for the hard work that you and the believers here have done. First, to bring me to the city and to make this night possible with all of these beautiful brothers and sisters of ours. Thank you, brother. I think that Las Vegas, Nevada owes Brother Alfred Muhammad a debt of gratitude. Let us respond and thank you. And of course to his lovely wife and daughter whom we thank because no man can do great work if he has hell in his house. There has to be a strong woman, not behind every great man, but right beside every great man. To these distinguished rostrum guests, leaders, reverend clergy, politicians, civic leaders, and ministers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, my dear and beloved brothers and sisters of Las Vegas, I am so happy to be here with you tonight. I have wanted to come back to Las Vegas for a long, long time. And I am one of those grateful brothers who is grateful to Minister Alfred Muhammad for extending to me this invitation to be here with you tonight. I don't intend to keep you very long but I do intend to be exceedingly strong in that which we want to get over to you tonight. And you'll have to pardon me if I get a little carried away because I'm happy to see you and to be with you and among you. Brothers and sisters, there is an unprecedented wave of crime and violence taking place in black communities across this nation. And young black men are killing young black men in unprecedented numbers. Never in the history of our sojourn in America have black people been so destructive to one another. This wave of violence and crime that is sweeping our communities demands the attention of every preacher, every teacher, every religious leader, every civic leader. It demands the attention of government. For if this continues, we are on a path of total self-destruction. We must examine this problem see what the cause of it is, then we must apply the proper medicine 
that we may heal the black community, that we may come up out of this condition and be a people worthy of the respect of the nations of the earth. Once every 24 minutes in America, a human being is murdered. That means that by the end of this year, approximately 23,000 persons will have died by murder. In the war in Vietnam, America lost 55,000 killed, 35% of which were black people. So in nine years of war in Vietnam, we lost approximately 2,000 lives. I'm sorry, 20,000 lives. But of the 23,000 deaths that will occur this year, 55% of them will be black people. And 96% of those black people will have been killed by black people. That means that this year, over half of 23,000, meaning 12,000 black lives will be lost. In two years, we will have murdered more of our own than we lost in nine years of actual combat in Vietnam. What does that say? It is safer for us in a war zone than to try to live our lives out in the inner cities of America. On, this is tragic. According to statistics, a white woman has one chance in 606 of exiting this world by means of murder. A white male has one chance in 186 of exiting this world by means of murder. The black female has one chance in 126, but the black male has one chance in 21 of exiting this world by means of murder. That means one out of every 21 men in this audience tonight probably will leave this earth killed not by an enemy, a known enemy, but killed by his own brother who doesn't recognize him as a brother. A young black man named Mr. Bush was shot down recently by three white police officers. Naturally, the coroner's jury always comes back with the same verdict, justifiable homicide. The black community is enraged, as we should be. But brothers and sisters, if we are enraged over a white policeman killing a black youth, and whites have been killing us since our fathers set the soles of their feet in the Western Hemisphere, that is a natural pattern with them. So it's natural for us to be angry when they do it. 
But how much more upset should we be when every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights we send each other to hospitals in great numbers, but there's no marches, no protests, no nothing when we slaughter one another? As I was coming here on the plane, I picked up the Newsweek magazine and in it there was an article about the environment. And I think the title of the article was, The Green is White. As I read into the article, it talked about white men and women, boys and girls, who are very concerned about the environment, the poisoning of the air, the water, the earth. But what is little known is that in every major city in America, the toxic Waste is dumped purposely where black people live and in many communities across this nation. The toxic waste is seeping into the water supply. Many poor people don't have the money to buy one of these water purifiers. We take it for granted that the water coming from our spigot is a good water and we're drinking death. We're breathing death because nobody cares about black human life. They want to purify the water, the atmosphere. But when black people talk to the Greenpeace people, about the environmental suffering of black people. They were not prepared to deal with human suffering from toxic waste because white people thought more of cleaning up air and water for them rather than saving black lives that are dying from the dumping of toxic waste. America loves profit more than people. What has happened to human beings that we think more of things than we think of people? So to make a profit, people will cook your food with chemical death, sell it to you, make you buy your own death. You don't study chemistry, you don't read labels, you eat food and die of carcinogens. Because the merchants of death who love money more than people are poisoning the food, the water, for profit, feeding hormones to chickens and pigs and cows, fattening them faster than nature would fatten them, to get them to the market quicker, to make a bigger profit, and your children are eating this kind of meat, and you are eating this kind of death-dealing destruction. And you wonder why you're spreading quickly. Your children at eight and nine years old developing bigger breasts than many of you had at 30. Talk to me. Your little young girls walking around with a cabbage patch doll in one hand and a sanitary napkin in the other, nine years old, 10 years old, not having 
the wherewithal intellectually to master and discipline their own bodies and no parents around to supervise the children. So now the babies are giving birth to babies because we don't care anymore about life. We care more about money. I want to talk to you tonight about stopping the killing. Tonight, as we speak to each other in the Persian Gulf and in Saudi Arabia, 200,000 or more American soldiers stand ready to bleed their life blood out. Not for a genuine principle, but to bleed their life blood out because Mr. Bush says our way of life is threatened. I ask Mr. Bush, when you use the possessive pronoun our, whose way of life are you talking about? Certainly, you cannot be speaking for black people in America. Our way of life is not threatened. Our way of life is now threatening. It is difficult to live in America. We live under the very shadow of death. What will we be there dying for? And did you know, according to figures I have received, 60 to 65 percent of the soldiers there are black. Oh, they deny this. They say, it's not so. <laughs> but the press admits and the politicians admit that there's a disproportionate number of black brothers and sisters in Saudi Arabia, I asked Mr. Bush if we are there to protect the vital interest of America. When has America made black people and our suffering vital interest to this nation? And if America does not think enough of us after we built the country. Our slave labor built the country. And the money that they kept back from our fathers by fraud and deceit fueled the agricultural economy of the South. And the money that they robbed our fathers of was used to finance the industrial revolution of the North. We have fought, bled, and died in every war for America. We have slaved and suffered to build a nation that we cannot enjoy. We live in Las Vegas, but the money is on the strip, but just a few blocks away, we live in abject poverty. If we are not the vital interest of this nation, then we must not go or send our sons and daughters to protect their vital interests. Let Mr. Bush send his sons. Let Mr. Bush send his daughters. Let the rich send the rich and bring the poor soldiers back home. Now don't say I am un 
unpatriotic. Don't you dare say that. Say that I am standing for the poor. Who did Jesus stand for? What did the scripture mean when it said, blessed are the poor? Nobody poor is blessed in their poverty. But the poor are blessed because out of the poor came a deliverer. Jesus didn't come from the rich. He came from the poor for the poor. So if I seem to speak out for the poor, I just say I'm walking in the master's footsteps. <laughs> the price of oil could threaten America's economy. So America has to keep a certain control in the Middle East so that the price of oil may not go too high and threaten America's delicate economy. But America doesn't think that way where third world economies are concerned. America depresses the sugar market so that those economies based on sugar cannot build their own countries by the sale of sugar. America depresses cocoa and coffee. America depresses bauxite and, and rubber on the world market so that Europe and America can live at the expense of third world nations. America has never wanted the Arabs to have complete control over the pricing of their own commodity oil. But America takes the raw materials of Africa, Asia, Central and South America, and the Caribbean and buys it from the third world people for little or nothing and brings it to America and to Europe and then manufactures it and then sells it back to the poor people at high prices. Then comes the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. So the third world countries have to borrow themselves into debt that they will never get out of. Devalue their dollars, devalue their currency. While America lives in luxury at the expense of the poor of the world. But the poor Americans, the poor Americans, the poor blacks, the poor Chicanos, the poor Native Americans, the poor whites are taxed to the hilt and the government is about to close down even as we speak because Mr. Bush does not want to tax the rich who are more able to pay a tax than the poor and the working class people of America. Mr. Bush, in his hypocrisy, trying to make black people think that he is different from his predecessor. Mr. Reagan did everything in his power to turn back the hands of time. Our brother Thurgood Marshall, the only black man on the Supreme Court, said a few years ago that the Ku Klux Klan no longer wears white. The Ku Klux Klan is wearing black these days. The robes of Supreme Court justices bringing up conservative legislation to turn, or judgment, to turn back the hands of time. And so when Teddy Kennedy brought up some legislation in Congress that could reverse the evil of the Supreme Court. Our 
our friend, Mr. Bush, threatened that he would veto the Civil Rights Bill of 1990, though no black leader sees it as a quota bill. No intelligent white leader sees it as a quota bill. But Mr. Bush is going to veto the Civil Rights Bill at the same time that thousands upon thousands of black men and women sit in the Saudi Arabian desert to bleed their lifeblood out for some oil for Mr. Bush and the rich. I said, bring your sons back. Don't ever send your son to fight for this wicked enemy. This is why they don't like Farrakhan. It's not that Farrakhan is a teacher of race hate. It is not that Farrakhan is an anti-Semite or a bigot. It is that Farrakhan knows the truth. That same truth that Jesus said, you shall know, and that truth would make you free. But the difference between me and my brothers and sisters who know the truth and who quake and shake in fear to speak the truth. The scripture said, how can they know except they have a preacher? And how can they have a preacher except he be sent? The slave master's children are not going to send you a preacher to free you from them. Only God will send that kind of man. They are hot with me. But I have to tell the truth. Right now in Las Vegas, 103,000 black people live in Las Vegas. And 25,000 blacks live on the west side, predominantly black community. But 40% of the blacks in Las Vegas are unemployed. And 60% of the black youth from 16 to 25 are unemployed. Nobody cares if we have no jobs. We can't make a future for ourselves. Nature makes us gravitate toward the female and makes her gravitate toward us. We can't control that. That's nature. Nature makes us fall in love. We can't control that. That is God's doing. And when people say they love each other and come into close contact with each other, relationships begin, and from that comes the procreation of human life. We, we can't help that. But the sad thing is that even though we are driven by nature's law to meet and love and cohabit one with another and to produce new human life. We don't have the wherewithal mentally nor the education necessary nor the jobs available to allow us as black men to take care of what we bring into the world so the black man is under an extraordinary amount of stress. We are dying from stress and stroke, high blood pressure. We are so filled with confusion and doubt of self that we become drunkards and nobody closes the liquor stores in our community. They proliferate so we are steadily drunk dying because 
We're drowning our sorrows in alcohol, dying because we're drowning our sorrows in reefer, drowning, dying because we're drowning our sorrows in crack cocaine, dying because we do not know who we are, what our capacity is, what our gifts are, the opportunities even if white folk don't make them for us that there is the possibility of our creating opportunity for ourselves if leadership would show us the way. But the same government that sends our sons and daughters to die, that same government plans and plots against our leadership. You know, the head of the sperm carries the potential development of that human being. The tail of the sperm gives it mobility so that when it is cast into the hostile environment of the vaginal tract, that sperm may be able to swim toward the egg that it may start life. God allows the sperm to meet with ovum in a dark place and the first cell of life is created and when that cell of life is created, a tiny drop of blood is formed and it begins to spin in the darkness of the womb even as the planets spin in submission to the light of the sun. As that tiny drop of blood begins to rotate in the darkness of the womb because in the darkness of the womb and in the cell at the nucleus there is the presence of light letting us know that no matter how dark the situation is there's always light in the darkness if we would not despair and give up hope that there is light there if you can find the light and bring light up out of darkness. When the cells begin to multiply, the first thing that is formed is the head. Because until the head is formed, the arms and the legs cannot be called into existence. So the first thing that forms in the darkness of the womb is the head. And it is the head that calls the other members of the body into existence. And so it is that you are born with a head to see for the body, hear for the body, smell for the body, chew for the body, speak for the body, think for the body. And the body is grateful when you got a good head on your body. Yeah. <laughs> So it is with a people. It is God who gives you this head. It is God who gives the sperm its head. It is God who gives to people their leadership. True leadership. Are you listening? Yes, sir. Now, I want to make a point. If an enemy wants to keep you from developing as a people, they must keep true leadership from you. Once the true leader is born, he calls into existence 
the arms and the legs. He organizes his people and they become a people. And this is why in the book called Genesis, excuse me, I'm getting excited. In the book called Genesis, which is called one of the first of the five books of Moses. Why would you call it one of the first books of Moses when Moses wasn't around in the Genesis? But Moses was talking to people about the Genesis. Listen good now. Moses was dealing with an enslaved people and he was telling them in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep but the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said let there be light and there was light. Why, Moses, would you start off with the Genesis with your people? Because no people that are not free have begun yet. You do not begin your journey to life enslaved. You begin it when you become free. And in the word Genesis is the word genes. Gene. And in the genes is the coding of the human being. Its sickness, its health, its wealth is locked up in the genes. God is saying to Moses and through Moses to an enslaved people. Look, slave, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. That as you have a heaven above and an earth beneath, you have a relationship between heaven and earth. Otherwise, nothing can be produced without that relationship. It is the sun and the moon that draw the water up from the surface of the earth. Without the sun and the moon, the waters could not be drawn up into the earth's rotation, which is called gravitation. In a fine mist that the naked eye can hardly detect forming what you call clouds and when winds blow the clouds they come over a dry dead earth and when the cloud is filled with water heavier than gravitation the cloud distills the water back to the earth and the water from the cloud touches the sea in the earth and the sunlight strikes the earth, germinating the seed in the earth. And then the seed swells and bursts, sending a root down and then a shoot up. But if heaven didn't work together with earth, we could never have come up out of the earth. We could never feed our bodies to stay alive on the earth. But it is heaven and earth working together that produces what we call the quality of life. Everybody all right? Just bear with me. So as God created heaven, sun, moon, stars, planets, earth, and established a relationship between the two, God creates man with a heaven part and an earth part. But the heaven must work together with the earth to produce the same kind of effect. 
What must be in the brain of the human being is what the sun represents. You got to have a mind lit with the light of truth, knowledge, wisdom, understanding. Then the body working together with the light of the sun is the heaven working with the earth because the body comes from the earth. The bones are from the earth. The blood is from the water of the earth. But the brain cell can contain the light of knowledge. And when those two work together, the human being can grow up from the earth to become a reflection of God himself. Are you listening? Don't go to sleep, brothers and sisters. This is not too heavy for Las Vegas. It's not Baccarat. It's not Blackjack. <laughs> this is going to get right home to you in just a minute. <coughs> you sure do. We will, sister. Just be patient. We're working on that problem right now. Sister say we got an inferiority complex. Got a lot of Uncle Tom mentality. She said, help us get rid of that. I told her we're working on that problem right now. Working on it right now, my sister. Now look, look at what the scripture says. The earth was without form and void. Why are you telling us that, Moses? A slave people who don't have enlightened leadership are without form and voided. But until God's spirit moves on the face of the waters, meaning when God's spirit comes among the people, he will raise one up from the people as he drew Moses up out of water. He's making a leader for slaves. You're not going to be nothing in this world until a leader comes up. Not any leader made by your enemy, but a leader born of the Spirit of God. Are you understanding me? Now look, I'm not going to keep you here too long. But what I'm saying to you, Las Vegas, is that every time we produced a leader that could pull us together, the same government that sends our boys and girls to die, plotted to kill our leaders. That's what I'm saying to you. This is not your friend that you're fighting and dying for. This is your worst enemy that you're fighting and dying for. And don't get scared. Listen. I don't want none of the leaders to get frightened. Because I'm doing the talking, brother. You can tell them you didn't know what I was going to say. <laughs> but I'm going to prove my point, Reverend. I'm going to prove my point, Reverend. Because I don't want you to doubt me. And I know you don't. You don't doubt me at all. But you may be a little afraid. But I want you to challenge your fear. Because the scripture says the fearful and the unbelieving will have their part in the lake that burns with fire. We've come too far along the road to be afraid today. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? Huh? So look, bear with me now. You know Nat Turner was a leader that came from us. Denmark Vesey was a leader that came from us. 
Booker T and W.E.B. Du Bois were leaders that came from us. Come on. Marcus Garvey was a leader that came from us. But every time we had a strong leader, the government caused us to kill him or they killed him themselves. Come on. Am I telling the truth or what? In our modern era, when Rosa Parks sat down, Martin Luther King stood up and he died at 39 from an assassin's bullet. Not because King was a bad man, but because King was preaching against America's involvement in the war in Vietnam. So King was assassinated and now they name streets for him. You don't need streets and alleys and boulevard. You need Dr. King. You don't need Malcolm X Boulevard. You need Malcolm X. We don't need Whitney Young Boulevard. We need Whitney Young. We don't need our leaders to have alleys and boulevards and streets named after them. We want America to get the hell out of the way and leave our leaders alone and let them live. So by killing our leaders, before our leaders could really do the job that God called them to do, we became a people, void, never developed. We got hands, but they don't work for us. They're not coordinated. You got white head on black body. So your hands build for your enemy and you fight for your enemy, but you don't know how to defend and build for yourself. What happened to your head? When somebody gets hit in the head and they get paralysis, their hands don't work for them. Their feet don't work for them. You call the brother handicapped. Well, that's us, brother. We are handicapped. Our hands don't build no factories. We build no schools. We build no hospitals. We don't enter into international trade and commerce like a living people because every time you get the right kind of leader, they kill him or they talk about him like a dog and make us kill him. And that's why the press calls me anti-Semite. Hate a bigot. Because they know that you are taught to love. You are taught that God is love. And if I am a hater, then I have to be either the devil or of the devil. Come on. So when they drop that word out on you about me, you say, I'm not going near that man. He's a hater. He's a hater. Let me ask you a question. Since some of you just met me, who taught you to hate yourself? I wasn't around then. Who taught you not to love your own origin in the world? I didn't do that. Come on. Who gave you that sick mentality that makes you think you're inferior because you are black and only something light, bright, near white, or white is of any value? Who gave you that sick mind? It wasn't Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan didn't teach you to bleach your hair to try to be like white people. Louis Farrakhan didn't teach you to buy blue eyes and green eyes so you could be like white people. Louis Farrakhan didn't do that.
Louis Farrakhan don't teach black people to walk by black businesses where they should spend their money, but they walk by their own black businesses, put them out of business and give their money to those who don't care for them or their community. Louis Farrakhan didn't teach you to do that. But Louis Farrakhan comes from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to reverse all of that. And because, because the Spirit of God has moved on the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And the people that walked in darkness are beginning to see a great light. And upon them hath the light shined. Then those who killed our leaders to keep us in darkness are afraid now because they just can't quite get to me yet. It's too late. I say to the FBI that's present, take this back to your boss. You're too late. I'm on time. And the God of time is with me. And never again will you rob black people of leadership. We are on our way up and no power will stop our rise. Even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I don't fear any evil because God is with me. Yes, I say like David, I have no knowledge of myself, but if the Lord is my shepherd, then I'm not in want. If you listen to me just a few more minutes, you will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Lord is my shepherd because you will never have heard a black man talk like this black man that you hear tonight because when God raises a man up, he don't need a college degree. I never finished college. I advise all of you who are there, finish. But God didn't allow me to finish because he don't want nobody to claim me but himself. I don't have any letters behind my name, no BS or BA, no MS or MA, no LLD or MD or DD or PhD. <laughs> but the scripture says, how come this man having not letters is learned since white America can't claim to be my teacher and white America can't claim to be my father then when you hear the son speaking wisdom don't stop at the son but ask yourself, who taught the boy? Since wisdom is known of her children. Now let's move this thing on to its zenith.
in this world. We as human beings are devalued and things have more value than human beings. I have in my pocket a $50 bill with a dead president, <laughs> Mr. Grant, on this $50 bill. Now, if I drop this and didn't remember that I dropped it, somebody would pick it up. And they may not say to me, oh, Brother Farrakhan, you dropped this. They would snatch this and say, and then look real innocent. Because this thing has value now in our eyes. It is paper. I can roll it up. It don't say nothing. I can throw it down. It don't say nothing. It don't cry out. But this has more value than you. Somebody will come along and kill you for this paper with a dead president on it. That somebody has given more value to this than to you and me. They have a Rolex watch bandit ring in Los Angeles. They tell me one man didn't want to part with his Rolex. He evidently valued his Rolex more than his life. So the gentleman robber had a chainsaw and cut off the man's hand with the watch and the ring on it. Since he didn't want to part with the watch, he had to part with what the watch was on. <laughs> Human beings are going crazy, are gone crazy. The measure of a man is not what he has in his head. The measure of a man is the amount of gold he wears around his neck. So we will kill each other for gold that cannot speak, cannot think, cannot will, cannot dream, cannot desire, cannot bring into concrete reality the thought but it has more value than a human being. We value fur coats. We value oil. We value diamonds. We value things more than people. So because we have put things over people, then we have devalued what we did not create and put more value on the work of our hands. Let's talk now. How many of you went to church today? Would you raise your hands? That's all? Reverend, we got a problem here. 
I'm going to ask this question again. <laughs> I want you to be truthful. Tell the truth. <laughs> How many of you went to church today? Seriously, would you raise your hand? Oh, that's a little better than the last time. I'm not going to attack nobody for going to church. But look, have you noticed when you go to church, music is playing, it's real soft, and you start tipping, you know. And the, the child make a little more, shh, shh, shh. We in church, we quiet. If somebody in the congregation step up on the altar where they don't belong, maybe the deacon will say, hey, stand down. Don't come up here. This is the Holy of Holies. Get, get down. I'm, I'm making a point, Reverend. I'm, I'm really making a point. I want you to hear me well now. Whose church is that? You say, this is God's house. <laughs> is it really? Isn't it your handiwork? Talk to me. You all build churches. They're made out of stone. Some got marble in it. Some got gold in it. And it's really a holy place. So we walk around the church quiet. Won't swear. But that's the handiwork of man. But look at you. Any architect can build a church. But which one of them can reproduce you? Don't you see that the real house of God ain't stones? The real house of God is you and you and you and you and you and me and us but this temple of the living God can only be what it should be when the divine spirit and word of God lives in us but if we are devalued then you have more respect for the house of stone than you have for this precious house of God. And so today, human life isn't worth much. We kill each other for hamburger, kill each other for drugs, kill each other for little or nothing. Why? Because we value everything else above this life that we have been blessed to have. May I tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, why God is very displeased with the rulers of this world? And he's going to take them all down, including Bush, <laughs> Margaret Thatcher, Gorbachev, Deng Xiaoping. You can call all the boys off that you admire. Every one of them, God is going to sit down. Christ alone is going to rule this. Now, how many of you that preach that really believe it? <laughs> Because some of us that preach Christ want the government of evil to stay in power. Talk to me. Some of us that preach 
Jesus Christ, knowing that this kingdom, his kingdom was not of this world, but he, we were taught to pray. Thy kingdom come, not Bush's kingdom. Not Reagan's kingdom, but God's kingdom. Come, thy will be done. Where? On earth. But do you really want that? Whether you do or don't, he's going to overturn all the kingdoms of this world because there's not one of them worthy to be the steward of human life because every one of them have devalued the life of human beings. I say this, I'm going to bring this to a conclusion but I don't want nobody to leave till it is concluded your life is so sacred when you leave here tonight I want you to go home and look at yourself and know who you are. Let's look at who you are. First of all, you shame to be black. Let me hear you. Now, God is no respecter of persons, you know. He don't care nothing about whether you're black or white or red or brown. He doesn't judge you by your color. However, since we live in a world that has judged us by our color, we need to know the value of our color. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to us, we are not black because we are cursed. We are black because we are the original life in the universe. Listen carefully. Now all of you who read Bible and Quran, I'll teach it from both books so you won't think I'm making something up. Black people, as long as you believe that black is a curse, you don't like black. Look at this. When they tell you Jesus is the Son of God, is that right? They say when you see the sun, you see who? For the sun is in the father and father is in the sun. What did the sun look like? He looked like Caucasian. They painted him white. That's what they did. Now if you believe that, look at what it does to your mind. Check this out. If the Son of God is good and God and white and the Father of that Son is good and God and white and the opposite of good is evil and the opposite of God is devil and the opposite of white is black then what do you think about yourself? Come on, come on. You don't think too much of yourself. Listen to yourself talk sometime. A nigga ain't nothing. If I'm embarrassing you, it's not my fault. I'm just saying what you say. We ain't never been nothing. We ain't gonna be nothing. Who taught you that? Yeah. Jesus is king. He's
he's a ruler. If Jesus is a ruler and God is in Jesus, God is a ruler. Jesus and God are white. White man should be a ruler. What should black people be? Servants of white rulership. Check yourself out. When white folk give orders to black people, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. When black people give orders to black people, who the hell you think you are ordering me around? Listen to me. Uh huh. I know it hurts. <laughs> you don't like yourself. And you know what? White folk made a deliberate distortion of truth to serve their own political, social, economic ends. Jesus was not a Caucasian. Why don't white people tell the truth? Wait a minute, Caucasians, don't get angry. Don't get angry, white people. Please don't get angry. But listen, white people. If you're a Christian and you believe that Christ is coming again, and he is, when he returns, how are you going to handle it if he comes back and he's black? Face that. Check that out. Think about that. Just think about it. Well, I ought to ask the preachers in the house, how you going to handle it? Because there's some preachers who would say, what? You's an imposter. We've been waiting 2,000 years to get tricked like this? <laughs> some preachers would think just like that. Now, I just want you to consider this. The scripture said he had hair like lambs wool. Stop right there. We ain't got to go too much further. If he had hair like lambs wool, there's some white people who got some frizzy hair. But let's go a step further. <laughs> in the book of Daniel Daniel is talking he said I beheld till the thrones were cast down meaning all the rulers sat down and the ancient of days did sit he had hair like lamb's wool he had feet like burnished brass he had eyes like flaming coals he ain't talking about a white man now he's talking about a black man coming into power again seeing those of you who can't take wisdom coming from a black man you better check out now it's all over. <laughs> you are not black because you're cursed. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says you are black because you are the original life in the universe. The Bible says from one blood came all human beings. And the black man and woman is that one blood from whom all human life came. The Quran teaches us that we came from Adam. And the Quran says Adam was fashioned out of black mud into shape. 
The Quran is telling you that the black man is the original man. He's Adam. The original Adam. Now listen carefully. We want you to value your life from this point on. You can't value what you don't know. You are more than who you think you are. Now don't let the lighter ones of us get disturbed. Some of us light-skinned ones are beginning to feel sad now. What? Farrakhan. <laughs> Tell the real truth, Farrakhan. Now wait a minute. You know as light as I am, if I can preach this kind of truth, every light-skinned person in here should feel comfortable. Don't feel bad. Because we are all part of one family. Lighter or darker. We got to get rid of this sickness of color. But before we get rid of it, we have to teach the truth of it. Could no white man get here without coming through us. If the white man were the first man, we never could have got here because it's a mathematical impossibility for any white person to produce yellow, much less brown or black. They can't do it. Can't do it, white people. We are your father. We are your mother. And the Bible said, honor your mother and father that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God giveth you. We're just talking a little truth. Now, I don't want any white person in the audience to feel bad. But you know what? This will, this will help straighten out your mind. When you walk around thinking you better because you're white, this will heal you. This will make you say, well, wait a minute. I came from these people. These people are the origin and source of my life. You didn't know anything until we taught you. You didn't get your knowledge from the ether. You got it from our black fathers. We sent you prophets. We sent you prophets. Now don't get angry. Don't get angry. But brothers and sisters, every human life no matter what color is sacred and no human life should be devalued and put beneath things now bear with me because I want to try to wrap all of this up and I've got just a few more minutes in which to do it. Now, brothers and sisters, listen. This is critical to understand. Do you know why your life is valuable? More than the sun, more than the moon, more than the stars, more than mountains, more than sea. You know why your life is valuable? Because male and female are made in the image and the likeness of the creator and any time you kill another human being that is like murdering God I'm gonna say that again man cause, and I'm gonna prove my point I'm gonna prove my point Sun can't think. The sun can only be the sun. We need the sun. It's a beautiful thing. 
the moon can't think, neither the stars, but you, male and female, can think, can will, and bring into existence what you will. Both the Bible and the Quran talk about what man's capacity is. It is to govern what God has created. Oh, listen to me. Bear with me a few more minutes because I don't want none of you to leave here thinking that anything that we wear or have on or have is what gives us our value. Your value was given to you from the day that you were formed in the image and the likeness of God. Nothing else need to be given to you. Listen. In the genetic makeup of the male, talking now to the man God didn't make niggas now, I'm gonna say that again now don't get uptight don't get angry don't get upset I'm not insulting us but God don't make niggas God don't make coons and ha uh, ham bones and shines God don't make Uncle Tom's and Uncle Auntie Thomasina's God don't make Uncle Tomahawks and Auntie Tomahawks. This is the creation and the making of all of this sick world. God doesn't make lesbians. God don't make males who want to be females. You didn't hear me? That's not God's doing. It didn't say in the 26th chapter of Genesis, and God said, let's make what we don't know what it is. God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Talk to me. So if you're anything other than that, somebody else been tampering with what God made. Are you listening to me? Give me a few more minutes. And God said, let us make man. Now remember this is in the Genesis, which don't mean in the beginning of the book. It means in the genetic coding of every male member of the human family. Every female member of the human family. He and she both made in the image and likeness of God well I thought Adam was a man no the scripture says male and female created he them and called their name Adam so when you say only man is made in the image and likeness of God what is a woman made in the image and likeness of since you man couldn't get here without a woman how in the hell can you make a woman less than yourself when you came through her, from her? I'm talking to you, man. Don't worry, sisters. When we finish tonight, you're going to be back on your throne. All right. But in the male, in the male, God gives to every male the capacity to rule, to govern. And he gave man dominion over the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and over every creeping thing that crawls upon the earth. Man is by nature a ruler. That's why men are much more aggressive. This is why men lack power. Because men know that 
power is necessary in order to establish your capacity to rule. Listen good now. God gave man orders. These orders are not in the Genesis. They're in your genes. Be fruitful. Multiply. Replenish the earth. Subdue it. Bring it under your power, man. He ain't talking about be fruitful, have a lot of babies. That's the lower end of that totem pole, brother. When God is telling man be fruitful and multiply. You learned multiplication, didn't you? There was a multiplier, a multiplicand, and you got a product. God is saying to man, I put you in the earth. I gave you a brain. I'm breathing into you the breath of life, meaning my own knowledge and wisdom. Now I put you in the earth and I got you here in a universe of truth. Take what I've given to you, multiply it but what, by what you came into and produce a product that bears witness to me. Every man by nature is a producer. And whenever a man is denied his divine right, not human right, divine right to be a producer, no man can be a man unless he's a productive man. And when you deny a man the right to produce, you have murdered that man. We got to stop the killing different approach you listening now look at my brothers every male in this house is potentially very great I'm gonna say it again every male in this house is potentially great but in order for every man to become a man, somebody got to breathe into you through your ears the knowledge to make you a reflection of God. You can't fulfill your capacity to rule, govern, multiply, and subdue without knowledge. So he who deprives you of knowledge deprives you of your divine right therefore he kills your divine right to the capacity to govern to rule to multiply to replenish the earth and subdue it white man you have got to stop the killing for you have killed these black men and when you kill a black man you don't have to shoot him to kill him all you got to do is put him in a position where he can never be what God created him to be then you make him your nigger your tool your footstool your boy are you listening so he calls you boy. Hey boy, come here boy. And if you stand up like you want to be a man, they beat you down. This is why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad proposed separation. Because the white man, as long as we're under his rule, he's not going to let you be a man in what he calls his house. He'll hire a black woman before he'll hire a black man. Why? What is the nature of a woman that's different from the nature of a man? Come on. Y'all all right? <laughs> what is the difference with a woman and a man? Now, if the man genetically is coded to be a producer. What is the woman coded to be? She's a producer too. She's a thinker too. 
Everything that a man is capable of thinking, women are capable. She is our partner in this. But look at the way God fashioned her. I don't want you to be alone, Adam. So I'm going to give you a woman as a what? Help meet. Not help mate. Help meet. Now when you meet something, that means there's an obligation, an expectation, a goal, a purpose, and when you fulfill it and meet the objective, then the objective has met with reality and have become one. A woman is put in the world to help the man meet the requirements, the purpose, the aim that God has put on a man. You don't need a woman if you're not doing nothing. You don't need a woman if you're not going any place. You don't need a woman, brother. That's why you in hell right now with every woman that you got. Listen good. Listen, listen, listen. You want me to explain why y'all having this problem, right? And you know, sisters, y'all got a problem with us. Is that right? And you know, brothers, we got a problem with our women. Is that right? Our problem is... If you ask the brother, where you going? I ain't going no place. <laughs> what you doing? I ain't doing nothing. <laughs> What's happening? Ain't nothing happening. <laughs> Meet my baby. This is my girl right here. This is my woman right, right, right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What you need a woman for? You ain't going no place? You ain't got no objectives she can help you to meet. Only thing you got in your mind, hey baby, hey baby. Come on over to my crib. Come on mama. You know what a crib is? It's a place where babies hang out. Men don't hang out in cribs. Babies hang out in cribs. Talk to me. This is why white people don't respect us. Because we are on the plane of children. We are playing with each other. We are not living the life that God intended for us to live. Now look, sisters. This ain't written in no book. It's in your nature. You may fall in love with a man. He looks good. He goes to the spa, he works out. <laughs> and when you see him disrobe, you say, mm -hmm. what a hunk of man that is. <laughs> Until you marry him. <laughs> then, you want him to produce. And the poor man <laughs> then in a few months he's asking where did the love go? <laughs> you going downtown he's laying at home. He ain't got no job and don't know how to produce a job. You say, well, baby, I'm going downtown. I'll be back. Look at the soaps and tell me what happened. <laughs> and honey, put the sardines on so that when I get back, I won't have to cook nothing. Well, who's the man in that house? Who's the producer? When she comes home, she got bass in her voice. Hey, where's my food? And the man is saying, well, darling, I was so busy, I just... <laughs> or 
you may take this attitude. Look, you don't tell me. And the only way you can enforce your manhood is to beat her up. And most of our women in here suffer from abuse, men beating up their women. What kind of man are we to beat a woman? There's not a man nowhere on this earth that has a right to beat up a woman, brother. You don't beat your woman. I know what you're saying, brother. You don't know my woman. If you had five minutes with my woman, you'd live in her mouth like a dentist. But wait a minute, brother. I know your woman. She's my sister. She's my mother. She's my family. I know her. I know what she wants out of life. But sister, it's not the man's fault. So don't beat on him. Don't blame him. He needs help today. He needs help. And if you beat him down, he's going to strike back at you. You so disappointed in the man, you just beat him down verbally. I don't know why I married you. You just make me sick. I thought you was more man, but I can see you only wanted me for my body. Well, that's all you showed him. You didn't show him too much more. Excuse me, Reverend. I... Look at how women have been reduced. We got you in beauty contests now. You parading across the stage. 36, 23, 38. <laughs> you like a piece of meat. Men want to look at you before they buy you. Let me see that. I mean, that's not what you are, sisters. You're not a piece of meat. You're a very magnificent creation of God. And any time a man treats you like a piece of meat, or any time you allow yourself to degenerate into just a piece of meat, boobs and butt, then you have devalued yourself. And what you see is what you get. This is killing the human being. You are not what you should be. You are literally dead. The black man is dead as a man. And sister, if he's dead as a man, you can't be alive as a woman because you are his first teacher. And if you don't know what to teach him, as the scripture said, a wise child maketh a glad father, but a foolish child is the heaviness of its mother. So if you don't know what to teach a male child, you don't know how to make a man. So the black woman is in pain because she has no man. And the black man is in pain because his nature tells him he's a man, but he can't produce the evidence of his own manhood, of his own divinity, of his own worth. And so you walk around depressed, stressed. So you drink a lot. You smoke a lot. You gamble a lot. You pump iron a lot. You have sex a lot. Because that's the only way you feel you can show. I'm a man. Come on, man. Come on. 
you're dead and white folk and their world has killed us we got to stop the killing not only are we dead and devalued now I want to show you beloved how you kill without guns did you know that your mind is created to feed on truth when people deliberately lie to you and feed you lies in the place of truth they kill your mind and they kill your spirit <laughs> White folk told us they found us in the jungle with bones in our nose, swinging from tree to tree. Is that the truth or is it a lie? <laughs> but some of you don't even know. If you don't know, then if they say it, you have a tendency to believe it. How in the heck could we build their world if we hadn't built one before? You don't take a savage out of jungle and let him build your world. We built their mansions. We cooked their food. We dressed the white woman. How could we do that unless we were civilized? Our fathers were master builders. But when they lie to you and you begin to believe a lie, they start killing the power of your mind. Columbus discovered America. All these Indians here. George Washington never told a lie. Chopped down the cherry tree. Abraham Lincoln freed you. Santa Claus is coming down the chimney. Bringing you goodies. Come on. Heaven is way up beyond the sun, moon, and star. Golden streets up there. They got telescopes now. They can see the far planet Pluto 4 billion 600 million miles from the sun. They inspired heaven yet. <laughs> if you don't get it on this earth, you ain't going to get it at all, brother and sister. They lied to you. Kill your mind. Let's stop the killing. Let me show you how you kill a woman without pulling a trigger. Brothers, raping a woman is akin to killing her. Rape is up in the black community. And most black women that are being raped are not being raped by white men. They're being raped by their own. Do you know, brother, that when you take a woman against her will and violate her, she is scarred for life. And unless God redeems her, she can't come back from that. Many women that have been raped have never from that point been able to relate to a man properly. She's, for all practical purposes, dead as a woman. Because her nature is to console a man. Her nature is that a man should find heaven, peace, quiet of mind in her. But when she has been raped and abused by a man, it's difficult for her to ever give a man the heaven that God put in her for man. This is how you kill a woman. You kill a woman when you bring a little girl in the world 
and the little girl is growing up and her father takes his daughter to bed with him. That's killing the little girl. Any woman that's here and most of our women have suffered incestuous abuse, brothers and sisters. Many of our young girls have been abused by their own fathers, by their brothers, by their uncles. Some young men have been abused by their uncles, their cousins. When you take a young girl that trusts her father and literally he becomes the first man in her life and that's the man that she's going to pattern the men that she will learn to love after him and then the man can't handle it and takes the girl to bed. Reverend, we got to preach about these things. Not necessarily in the spirit that we are so much better than the people who are doing this, but we got to get our men up out of that sick mind where you're killing your girls, killing your daughters, killing your stepdaughters. Some of you women who have babies, female children, and you're young and beautiful. You go out, your husband is gone somewhere or out of the picture. You get a man, you're not looking to see what kind of man that is for your children. You love him and that's all there is, but sometimes he's looking over your shoulder at your daughter. And while you are going places, he's playing with her. Sometimes your daughters are trying to tell you. And some of you mothers are so weak. You don't want to lose a man, so you don't listen to your daughter. And you blame it on your daughter when it's not your daughter's fault. We got to stop the killing. A man may say, I'm guilty of that, but how can I get out of it? I tried to study this. God blessed me with five beautiful daughters. And you know what? If my daughters came up on this stage, you'd see them around me and they literally adore their father. And they marry their husbands to get a husband like their father. And I try to understand what makes men do this. I don't think yet that I fully understand because I've never been that so I really don't understand but I'm trying to penetrate it. And what I think happens is this. Mothers get careless with themselves and they lose the capacity to console and comfort their husbands because he's not really the man that they thought he was. He's the father of their children and they've been together for 20 or 30 years, but the thrill is gone. She's not happy with herself, so she eats too much. And she begins to get fat and then ugly and then ugly acting. No, 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 I'm not putting you down, but listen, sisters, if you don't love yourselves and you allow yourself to let yourself go, 
Look at the white woman. She's 90 years old in the spa. <laughs> trying to keep herself trim so she could trap somebody. <laughs> and here you are, 35, just eating yourself to death. Practically our, all our women are obese, overweight, bellies falling down on our knees. <laughs> and that man that you married is looking at you. He got old and ugly too. But he remembers you the way you used to be. And then your daughter come up looking like you used to look. And now she loves her daddy. And when he comes home and he says, baby, would you fix me a sandwich? Fix it yourself. Then the daughter says, daddy, I'll fix it for you. He said, baby, I got a pain in the back of my neck. Well, hell, don't work, work your neck. <laughs> but the daughter will say, daddy, and she'll put her hand on his neck because she feels him. His pain is hurt. You mothers are setting your homes up for destruction. And it's not really your fault. It's our fault as men. And it's not really our fault. It's the enemy's fault because he don't allow us to be the producer, the man that we should be. So the longer we live and stay together, the light of love begins to diminish and diminish and diminish. And then the man starts ripping off his daughters. Stop the killing. In our world, the holy world, the penalty for rape is death. We don't send nobody to prison for that. We kill them. You know why? God said a life for a life. And since you've effectively killed the woman, the only thing that can compensate for that is your own death. The divine law of God brings you death for incest. We got to stop the killing. I don't think I should close on such a hard note. But you see, killing goes on every day in different ways. Now we got to turn it all around and produce life where there once was death. And you know how to do it? You know what death is? Death starts when the human being rebels against the God who is the author of our life. Once we rebel against God, we set up the death of ourselves and our mind. This is what happened to Adam when he rebelled. The scripture says, all in Adam died. What is the death? Rebellion against God. And that's why Jesus said, thy will be done. When you do God's will, you become alive mentally. To the Caucasian people who are present, I want you to hear me and not be angry, but think. The mind of white supremacy is death for you and death for all those who come under your rule. White folk were given power to rule what they did not create. And when God gave white people the power to rule, he gave them the guidance of how to rule. And when they rebelled against God's guidance and ruled according to their own mind rather than God's mind, then death was set up in the mind of white people and they became 
death itself. I want you to hear me now, white people. Hear me, black people. I'm not teaching hate. I'm teaching truth. White people's minds represent death itself. And that is not funny. It's just plain truth. Follow this. Why do I say that, white people? Because when you rebel against God, that in itself is death. And when you set up your color as the criterion by which you judge the worth or lack of worth of another human being, then your mind is covered with death. And when white people began to believe that the whiteness of their skin made them better than the very people from whom they came, then they became in that mind a scourge to the planet. And everywhere the white man went, he brought death to the native people wherever he went. Listen to me good. You don't have to applaud. Just hear me. If I'm lying, stop me. I didn't write your history. You wrote it in the blood of the human family of our planet. When white people dehumanize people of color, they already dehumanize themselves. Am I telling the truth? Finally, if you read in the book of Revelations, it says, and I saw a pale horse, and death was its rider, and hell followed closely behind. You know why the scripture uses a horse? Because the horse is the most intelligent of the beasts and when human beings do not evolve toward God they are intelligent but low-lifed then the human intelligence becomes the intelligence of a beast and when death is the rider of human intelligence how does death ride your intelligence you know, horses don't accept riders unless they're broken. The mind of a human being will not accept no rider but God. God is the natural rider. But when death takes God's place and rides human intelligence, then everywhere we go, hell follows closely behind us. How does death ride your intelligence? When your intelligence is used to rebel against God, then death is riding your mind, and everywhere you go, hell will follow right behind you. Now, what's riding your intelligence right now? Is it God and life, or is it Satan and death? And if you look at your life, you don't see nothing in it but hell. Come on. There's hell in the home because death is riding in the house. There's hell in the church. There's hell in the mosque. There's hell in the synagogue. There's hell in the White House. There's hell on the earth because man has rebelled and in his rebellion, death has come over the intelligence of the human being. So the human being is a beast in human form and the people of God have the mark of the beast in their forehead and in their hands. Some of you in this audience are masons and shriners. I'm closing now. 
but don't get up. When you go in the lodge, how many degrees can you get? How many? 33. Stop right there. Is water the origin of life? What temperature does water freeze at? What temperature? 32. So if you got 33 degrees, you just one degree above freezing. That means you dead too. Now let's see if I'm telling the truth. Y'all all right? Let's, let's walk with me, Masons. Masons, is this a horizontal? Why is it horizontal? Because it is a, on the same plane as the earth. Is that right? That's a horizontal level. That's a dead level. When you're like this, you're either sleep, dead, or sick. Come on. When you're laying down, you sleep, you tired, you dead, you sick. But the moment you wake up, you get up. When you get up, your head rises first. Don't nobody get up throwing their foot up first. <laughs> when you get up, your head comes up first. Then the head pulls the body up. Am I right? Now, if you got three degrees, three degrees, poor thing. You can't even tell three degrees. That's like this. You still at a dead level, brother. You talking about I'm at a living perpendicular. You ain't seen perpendicular. There's no perpendicular in the lodge. Because to be perpendicular, you have to make right angles to the earth. And every right angle is how many degrees? 90 degrees. And they don't offer you 90, so let's go back to where you are. Now, y'all all right? I'm closing now. When you reach 33, this is where you are. You ain't even 45, which is half of 90. You right here. So if, you, if you're there, you're crawling. In a cave-like state. You're not up yet because this world can't raise you up because this world is death itself. White folk, your world is death. Death rides your intelligence and now the hell that you've given everybody else. As Malcolm said, those chickens are now coming home to roost. Well, who will raise you from the dead? It said a master has to come with a master grip and raise you up. I'm here to suggest to you that the master has come. And I'm here to suggest to you that we don't have to live with death riding our intelligence. We can throw off death as a rider and let God ride. Don't you sing a song in the church? Ride on King Jesus. What did Jesus come to Jerusalem riding? Come on. He was riding a donkey. Well, some say he was riding a jackass. <laughs> Jesus was riding a donkey. You know what that means? It means the unlearned masses of the people accepted Jesus. And when they accepted Jesus, they accepted God as a rider for their intelligence. And when God sits on a jackass, the jackass can ride.
ride into Jerusalem and the people will say, Hosanna in the highest. Listen good. When God rides our intelligence, we become a reflection of God. What did Paul say? Let this mind be in you. The same that was in Christ Jesus. What kind of mind did Christ Jesus have? He was not like Adam. He's the second Adam. As Adam rebelled and died in the mind and power of the mind, Jesus submitted and ascended to sit at the right hand of God. What does that mean? Man has the capacity to govern creation if man will bow down to God and let God be the rider then we can stop the killing forever man will be alive he'll be a producer he will reflect God and a woman will be able to console him and comfort him and help him to meet his objective because he's alive Oh grave, where's your victory? Oh death, where's your sting? Look at your brother. I once was dead, but I'm alive now. White folk used to ride my intelligence. Rebellion against God rode my intelligence until I met with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and he taught me how to submit my will to do the will of God. And the moment I submitted my will, I came up from a dead level, not to a 33 degree, but to a living perpendicular, standing on the square. Now I got my square and my compass, and I'm not a mason. I'm not a shriner. I'm the father of masons and the father of shriners. I am a, not a Muslim son. I am a Muslim. I'm not third degree or 33rd degree. I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end of that circle. I am one with my father. Huh? I'm alive now. I'm not killing my people. My word from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad put life in a black man and in a black woman and they begin standing up. I once smoked reefer. I once used pills. I once drank liquor. I once was a fool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I once was a disrespecter of women. But today, I don't need reefer. I don't need alcohol. I don't need drugs. I'm high all the time. What you high off of, brother? I'm high off of the knowledge and the wisdom of God. And every round keeps taking me higher and higher. And what the enemy fears is that you will come up from a dead level. And when you come up to a living perpendicular, they'll never be able to control you anymore if God becomes the rider. So Jesus said this. He comes and he knocks. And he said, if any man will open and allow me to come in, I will stay and sup with him. It don't mean that Jesus is knocking on your door to come in and have a pork chop dinner. Because Jesus don't eat pork chops. Ham hocks. He 
wouldn't put no nasty food in his holy vessel. And he doesn't want you putting one dirty thing in this holy house. This is God's temple. You must keep it clean and holy. It means that any man who will allow God to knock on his, the door of his intelligence through his ear, if you will let God in, he will come in and take over the rule of your house. And when God lives in your house and takes over the rule of your house, when you walk, God walks. When you talk, God talks. When you act, God acts. When you will, God wills. That is what they fear, that you will allow God to be the master. And when God becomes the master, there is no death because God is the ever living. All the killing stop. All the dead stops. We have effectively stopped the killing when we submit to God. So in my conclusion, every woman in this house you are such a magnificent creature of God. Every woman, listen please, you are so wonderful that God has fashioned woman after the womb of the universe out of which God manifested his own glory. Listen, he takes the darkness of space and he says be and light comes. And we have a pregnant universe out there always producing new things for the telescope to see. Oh, look, we spied another star. Look, another planet. Look, another thing. Why? Because the universe is she. The universe is pregnant. And God created woman with a womb that is his laboratory where he co-creates from your womb. Oh, man. Do you know what that means? That your womb is sacred. This precious place in the woman is sacred. Your womb could not be sacred and you not sacred. Every woman is sacred. And if a man would look at a church and know that it is sacred, every man, when you look at a woman, you must know that she is sacred and you must be careful how we handle women. Listen, listen, listen. Not only is this womb sacred, but this is also a womb. And if you sisters will let God rule your life here, then what you produce from here will be another Jesus, another Moses, another Abraham, another Muhammad. And every one of you that love Jesus, you can produce him again and again and again if you will be like Mary and relate your life to God. You can produce giants on this earth that won't be a scourge to humanity, but will be saviors of the human family. Now, you that have a expecting a child tonight, you are pregnant and you don't know whether you want to keep it. In fact, tonight is Sunday and the abortion clinic opens tomorrow. And you were planning, probably, to get rid of it. 
I wanted to tell you a little story about my mother. My dear mother, who just passed away nearly two years ago, before she died, she told me that when I was conceived, she tried to abort me three times. I'm not a young man, even though I might look a little young. In a few years, God willing, I'll be 60 years of age. <clears throat> I have nine children and 24 grandchildren. How do I look? Pretty good? Now, <laughs> don't say, I knew he was with the devil. <laughs> only, only the devil could make an old man look young. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. I must know something. And I want to share that with you. But I want to say this about my mother. In those days, they didn't have abortion clinics like they have today. You don't miss with an abortion clinic. My mother was using a hanger. And she tried three times. Now, why did she want to kill me? What did I do? Here's what happened. My mom married my father. My mother's a very beautiful black, black, black woman. I'm going to say that again. She's a very beautiful black, like this beautiful sister right in front of me. She's a very beautiful black jewel. You are, sister. And my mom was beautiful and black like you. And she married a light-skinned, straight-haired, quote-unquote, handsome man. <laughs> and you know how it is when a black, black woman marries a light, light man that the world says is real cute. They try to hold on to him, you know what I mean. My father bless his heart he was kind of a philanderer that means he had a lot of women my mother didn't go for that stuff so finally she got tired of him put him out got a divorce and married my brother's father my brother's father is a dark skinned man like my mother and they produced my older brother, who is very dark. You know how these old loves are that you never get over? You got married and your first love starts slipping back into the picture. <laughs> this handsome, light-skinned man started slipping back into the picture. Now my mother had married my brother's father but unfortunately in a night of love little Lewis <laughs> was conceived. Now you can imagine the condition my mother was in. Married to a man and pregnant for another man. Now any of you that have had that experience I don't begrudge you what anguish you go through. How can I explain this? Well, you don't explain you have an abortion, so you don't have to explain. When you rob a bank and, and the bank robber knows that you saw him and recognized him, what does he think? He got to kill you because you blow the whistle on him. Well, the same way the robber thinks, that's the way the adulterer thinks. I'm going to kill the baby. Baby's innocent. I'm going to kill the baby so there ain't no evidence of my crime. So my poor mama tried to kill me. And when it didn't work, 
She said, I'm going to have it regardless. Now, when she said she was going to have it, she had to do a lot of praying because she was in trouble. And my mama prayed and prayed and prayed. All the time, she's forming me in her womb. But this womb is troubled and she got to rely on God. And so all of her insecurity made her cry out to God. And that cry and that prayer went right into the making of your brother. I want you to see how unfortunate circumstances God can turn them into blessings. So you have no right to kill the fruit of the womb simply because the circumstances of the conception are not just proper. My mother began to hope that I would come out dark. And since her husband wanted a girl, she was hoping that I would be a girl and dark. So perhaps she wouldn't have to explain me away. But when birth came, I came. I was not a girl. I was not dark. In fact, I was so light, my hair was kind of blondish light. She had to tell her husband the truth. And so they divorced. And my mother took my brother and me and reared us by herself. She never asked my father for nothing, my father. And he never offered her nothing. She wouldn't ask my brother's father for nothing because she had done him wrong. But she put her trust in God. And that woman from those unfortunate circumstances reared me up in God. Now I'm telling all of you, I am a child born in the spirit of God. I didn't have to go to no church to find God. God was with me in the womb like he was with you. And when my mother took the courage to face the obstacle of her life and bring me forward, she bred courage into me. So there ain't no government, no white man, no power that can make me bow down. I'm born of God and I will stand for you until death takes me away. So every one of you that are pregnant tonight, go on and have your baby. And don't worry about whether there's enough food for your child. The worms eat, the buzzards eat, the birds eat. God will not leave you without food. Trust in him and stop the killing. Don't kill the fruit of your womb. And if you've had an abortion, sisters, I'm not here to make you feel guilty. Lift up your heads. Lift up your heads and smile. Because what you did in ignorance we cannot undo. But God will forgive whatever we did in ignorance. But I tell you like Jesus told the woman who was found in adultery. He said, woman, where are your accusers? They had all fled because he rode in the sand. Him that is without sin cast the first stone. Then Jesus said, woman, Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Tonight, sisters, you have the right of choice. Choose the man that you intend to lay down with. 
choose morality over immorality, decency over indecency. But once you have chosen and your womb is full, then don't you second guess God. Let it be. Because you in those unfortunate circumstances may produce the answer for sickle cell anemia, the answer for cancer, the answer for the deliverance of our people. Look at what my mother tried to kill. But I'm here. And because I'm here, black people are coming alive with the message of truth because God would not allow my mother to kill me. Stop the killing. And when we leave here tonight, Las Vegas, Christians, Muslims, let's stop arguing over denomination. Stop it. Don't say Baptist is better than Methodist, Methodist better than Episcopalian, Catholic better than this or that. Jesus wasn't none of that. Come on. I never read in the Bible where Jesus said, I am a Baptist. Jesus was baptized. Come on. So when you say I'm a dyed in the wool Baptist, that may be what you are. But what you want to be is what Jesus was. Come on. Jesus was not a Methodist. He had the method. He said I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But he never said I'm a Methodist. He never said I'm a Catholic. He said I'm the light of the world and that's universal. He never said I'm a Jehovah's Witness, but he certainly was the witness of Jehovah. He never said I'm Episcopalian, but he was the bishop. Come on. He never said he was holiness. He said if the first fruit is holy, then the lump is also holy. He never said he was Pentecostal, but without Jesus there would have been no day of Pentecost. All these are your denominations in your struggle to get closer to God. You have divided the house of God. And now you glory in your divisions that are man-made. Come on. Look at the Muslims. I am a Shiite. I am Sunni. I am Sufi. I'm Hanbali. What was Prophet Muhammad? He wasn't Sunni. He gave us the Sunnah. Without Prophet Muhammad, there would be no Ali to marry his daughter Fatima to produce Hussein and Hassan from which the Shiites get their teaching. Muhammad didn't divide you. You divided yourself. Now you glory in your divisions. Come on, Greek letters. Some of you are Alpha. Some of you Delta. Some of you Kappa. Some of you Omega. And you're arguing with each other over what fraternity we're going to join. You don't need to join that. And if you do, don't let it separate you from another letter of the alphabet. All you're doing is joining a Greek letter alphabet. Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, Zeta, Eta, Theta, Iota, Kappa, Lambda, Mu, Nu, Psi, Omicron, Pi. Huh? What is that? What is that? That's a Greek alphabet. And you run around, I'm Alpha, I'm Kappa, I'm Sigma, I'm Delta, I'm a fool. Just say it like that. <laughs> We're not many people. We're one people. God is one. The prophets are one. His religion is one. 
his people are one. Let's stop dividing and we'll stop the killing. Once we start uniting, we'll heal our wounds. So when we leave here tonight, let's try to heal the wounds. And when you see your brother and your sister, you know you're looking at a representative of the creator, so show each other respect. And the same respect you show to the church, you show it to one another, for this is the real house of God. And even if your brother's drunk and your sister's drunk, or she's a prostitute or whatnot, don't look at what she has become. Look at who she really is under all of that. Look at who he really is under all of that. And Reverend, if we can teach not what he has become, but what he really is, then we can resurrect what he is and throw off what he has become. Thank you for listening and may Allah bless you as I greet you in peace. Let's agree to stop the killing. Assalamu alaikum.